Uh, welcome everyone to this session. Uh, it's going to be a panel discussion on the role of uh, regional structure in supporting core science in uh, low and middle income countries. Uh, very happy today, I have two fantastic panelists who will be uh, discussing this. Uh, so today I have uh, uh, Professor Apollo uh, Lotufo, uh, who is a professor of medicine, and he will be introducing himself much more better than, my, my, than the way I do. Uh, so I also have today uh, Dr. Agnes uh, Kiraga, uh, who is a research scientist and head of data science program at the African Population and Health Research Center in Nairobi, uh, Kenya. Uh, over to you, Polo. Hi, it's me. Uh, thank you very much for the the, uh, the invitation. Uh, I will talk about the the uh, how the cohorts are organized in the Latin America and Caribbean uh, countries. So uh, now you have uh, three cohorts very well established, established in, in Mexico, the maestras, uh, most of them uh, with women. Uh, I'm the PI of the Elza Brazil, 15,000 civil servants with a 12 years follow up. And most recently uh, in Chile, the Malco study, one city uh, with uh, target uh, to understand the impact of the environmental disease, uh, environmental factors on cancer epidemiology. Uh, we have other uh, cohorts in our countries that are summarized here in this paper. Uh, in you have the CCLLC uh, consortium uh, that involves other countries uh, with uh, cohorts. Uh, some of them uh, were on uh, former uh, randomized controlled trials that now have uh, observational uh, follow-up. Could you follow, Fargo, second, or just the presentation? Yeah, that's fine uh, with the presentation. I think we just uh, uh, follow up uh, with uh, Agnes uh, to just talk us through. Uh, maybe, Agnes, you can start by introducing yourself and talk us through your, uh, your own quote. Thank you. I'll, I'll wait for the slides to come up around the Inspire. So I am, I am, um, all right, there it comes. I am uh, Agnes Jiraga again from the African Population and Health Research Center that is in Nairobi, Kenya. And this is the host for the Inspire Network, Inspire being implementation network for sharing population information from research entities. And uh, quite a lot of NAM uh, funders and partners. And the vision for the Inspire is to build a network for users and producers of population-based health data. And this network uh, largely includes uh, creation of data that is fair from the different uh, producers, that is accessible to researchers in Africa and beyond. And of course, our policymakers are in a bid to answer questions that are of relevance and should improve the livelihoods of people living in Africa. So the Inspire is noted part of the IHCC. Hopefully we make the 100K and join uh, the consortium. But currently we have data that comes in for close to five countries, largely in Eastern Africa and growing because we are getting uh, a lot of interest from Western Africa, countries like um, Senegal and Central Africa in Cameroon. So the, the platform has uh, largely HDSS sites for now, but the greater vision is to get all kinds of data and um, whether research-based data, health demographic surveillance data sets, uh, data sets that are coming in from researchers, because we believe that if you make data accessible to the uh, data producers and uh, researchers in a manner that is fair and accessible and also transparent, then um, you actually go much further in terms of developing uh, questions that, um, that are designed from the sites themselves and that are key to addressing questions that are pertinent for the livelihoods where the data are produced. So that is Inspire Network. Thank you. Great, excellent network. Uh, I'm gonna I just uh, ask you a few questions. I'm gonna start with you, Agnes. 
uh, in your own experience, uh, what have you seen to be uh, two or three challenges uh, to core science and uh, how can regional structure like the one you have described, uh, uh, like uh, IACC helps overcome these kind of barriers? Uh, I think as part of Inspire, one, it's a new network. Uh, it's only developed in 2019. So as you can imagine, we have a lot of issues around um, standardization of data. If you look at the HDSI sites that are coming in from all these countries, they might look similar, but they are very diverse as well. So in terms of creating a network that has data that is interoperable, that can be harmonized, you have data that might be collected in some rounds, but not collected in the other. So we face challenges a bit when you're trying to put this data together. Of course, that comes with quality of the data, but it's not, it's not unexpected. So we, we deal with it as we get more data and trying to work around that. The second issue, of course, in Africa is the lack of um, unique identifiers. A recent report by the World Bank showed that if you look at how many national, how many countries out of the 55 in Africa have um, national IDs, nearly every country has one, but how many of these are, you know, are digitalized, the proportion falls. And if you look at how many of these are actually biometric, it actually falls further. So record linkage, uh, unique identifiers beyond the primary data collection. If you want to get data in from different sources, it becomes even harder. So we are trying to get around this and of course uh, exchange experiences from IHCC and how cohorts have overcome this would be important. And then the last point is capacity. Uh, Africa is a young field, it's a young, it's still taking its baby steps in terms of data science, uh, getting um, all these systems in place. And we're not lagging behind, but we are jumping the leap in terms of what should be done. So we need to do a lot of capacity building. We have teams that we have to keep training. So having um, well-trained data teams to handle these cohorts, of course, is a challenge, but yeah, we, we, we face it and keep finding ways to solve that. Yeah, thank you very much, Agnes. Uh, Paulo, do you want to share your own experience? What's the? Uh, do you want to share your, your own experience in terms of challenges that you uh, you oh, have oh, and yes. how regional uh, structure uh, and... For ARPS, uh, when we were uh, beginning the ELSA Brazil uh, in 2002, was a big challenge uh, mm -hmm. because uh, most of the epidemiologists uh, they did not believe that it would be possible uh, a large epidemiological study in the in a elmic country. Uh, uh, it's a uh, most of people uh, believe in this, but we were against this belief, and uh, we got the support from the Minister of Health. Uh, since then, you are keeping uh, the cohort uh, with one excellent uh, follow up, and you have more than. 90, 70% of people uh, will follow up. Uh, it's a, a good experience. Uh, but considering the all countries, uh, you have a good experience uh, uh, with uh, inter uh, uh, change experiences with the colleagues from Buenos Aires that have a, a very good experience uh, uh, with teaching and getting uh, grants from the NIH and the other sources. Uh, the Chronicles in Peru, an excellent uh, people with a good experience uh, with field work and uh, also with the Malco in Chile and Maestras in Mexico. So now you have uh, a good experience between among us, uh, but you need more uh, support to join all of these cohorts and uh, with a single uh, aim uh, to study. We are trying to do that, but in this, in the last uh, seven years, was very difficult in Latin America accounts to to get funds. So I uh, thank you very much, uh, Paula. I'm just going to continue with you uh, on the next question. So how does regional structure, um, like the the one you you are in or other ones that you have seen, support individual courts? In, in this area, uh, such as uh, uh, biosample collection, management of data collection, management of, of funding collaboration outside of the region, education and workforce developments. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, 
uh, the, the counts um, are different. Uh, Brazil, Chile, and Mexico, uh, they have a, a much more uh, a strong governmental support than uh, Peru, Chile, and other countries. Uh, uh, but for Argentina and Peru, it's uh, sometimes interesting because uh, they are uh, able to get money from other sources. Uh, uh, I think it's a uh, very interesting uh, to, to, to explain. Uh, here in Elsa Brazil, in Malco, uh, yet, uh, you have a steering committee uh, uh, where you decide everything about the, the issues related to the studies. One example is about uh, biosamples. Uh, you have uh, a political approved by the National Ethics Committee uh, to use uh, samples uh, inside, outside. You have a lot of uh, collaborations uh, this morning. The people are showing a collaboration about the cognitive uh, function that you are uh, working together with Iceland, uh, Finland, uh, other countries. Uh, you do not have uh, problems to share biosamples. The problem with biosamples are the amount uh, uh, and that you have uh, people to do the, the, the separation of the samples and the shipment. And it's much more complicated than you uh, think uh, before. Uh, now you have uh, also collaboration about to uh, share data. So you have a very, very strong collaboration in thyroid disorders uh, using all the information. Uh, with, uh, it's uh, centralized in the Netherlands, but uh, with uh, participants of the all countries. Uh, and you have other projects uh, with the Hopkins about lipids and also in the UK with atrial fibrillation. So you have a good uh, experience for collaboration. In my opinion, uh, uh, it's a, a dream because I, uh, I work at it, uh, a lot of time in Angola. Uh, is that you can uh, have more collaboration with Africa countries, mainly about the uh, genetic answers. Brazil, uh, Brazil has the largest African uh, descendant uh, population, uh, very spread uh, uh, with inbreeding, not inbreeding, but uh, with the uh, people uh, related with natives and uh, European ancestors. So I think that's very interesting to to analyze this, um, you have a lot of the uh, studies uh, with genetic ancestry uh, with new uh, observations about the relations uh, about muscles, uh, uh, muscles and the uh, lipid profile, for example, uh, with a big difference uh, among people of uh, African ancestry. And then finally, I can talk about the, uh, you have an idea uh, uh, to have more collaboration to capacity building, uh, mainly for people in uh, IT. Uh, one problem that you have is uh, people with bioinformatics uh, uh, because the financial market, they uh, compete with us in the university. Most of the statisticians, mathematicians, they are hired by the uh, banks and the other enterprise. Uh, so I need more collaboration uh, with IT people, uh, formation of the people during the high school uh, at the college, uh, because it's uh, one, one bottleneck uh, of the, our, our researches is related to uh, people with the IT expertise. Yeah, thank you very much, Pula. Um, so uh, Agnes, do you, think that your experience uh, with the uh, Inspire Network uh, is different from what Pola is describing in Latin America or is or very, very similar? Yes, there's a lot of uh, similarities, particularly around uh, workforce development. Um, like you say, there's a lot of uh, attrition when you train people uh, having access to highly trained um, 
persons to support this cohort. So might be IT, uh, data engineers, or you know, software developers or bioinformaticians who support the cohorts. Those um, definitely are you know on high demand and better paying at times. But we have also embarked on training. We'll not tear because uh, actually right now there's a training going on by the Inspire Network. And we train um, the, the sites where we get the data in you know, all the basics of what would be a data pipeline. How do you get data from your site? How do you create an exchange protocol? How do you harmonize your data? Because that is critical for us to have sustainable data teams that can do this work even beyond the platform. So yes, workforce development is, is critical. We've also, um, uh, because it's a young network and still growing, we access to funds and support of course remains a challenge, but for every project that leverages the Inspire Network, we try to allocate funds to support some of these uh, teams and trying to you know, uh, reward or create level of effort for those who are extracting this data. And of course, the last point is around uh, linking these teams to other regional uh, platforms that are becoming available, like um, the African Population Court Consortium. These also create platforms where uh, HDSA sites can provide, um, can tap into other resources that we might not be able to provide, and uh, you know, and make sure that they benefit from the other the other available opportunities. And lastly, I think issues around um, empowering the teams to develop their own questions. Because if you develop a question from your data, with or without funding, if it's a pertinent question that is will you know uh, help the the country of origin where the data are collected, then it's easier for them to analyze the data, make it available, share it, and you know learn how to use it for effective decision uh, development and making. So challenges are the same, and uh, it's good to see that. Okay, so uh, you did mention about um, uh, not having maybe enough uh, data scientists and uh, bioinformatician. So what is the what is the uh, I know these people are always uh, highly trained. And uh, what are the limitations in getting access and giving these people the required salary that they get somewhere else? Uh, Agnes. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's a, it's it's beyond. Um, it's it's because whenever you have a very specialized skill, you're highly on demand, and uh, there will always be that person who will offer you the best standard. But if you create a sense of ownership, uh, a sense of value in what they are doing as data scientists, when you bring them on board and we train them, we let them define the questions. If, if they embrace this from the start, even with hopefully with a bigger bet of a bigger salary, they'll oh. stay with you. But uh, data scientists, they are not, it's not like we don't have them. They're there, but very few. But the field is growing, luckily. There's a lot of investment in data capacity. There are a lot of uh, consortiums like the DSI Data Science Africa that are increasingly trading many and many. So probably the problem will be, uh, it will be minimal in the near future. Yeah. Okay. Thank, yeah, thank you very much. So uh, Paula, I, I'm going to come back to you. So because you have described uh, some individual calls, um, what are the policy issue that you have encountered uh, with uh, data sharing and uh, data governance, and how can regional structure like the IACC support navigating these kind of issues? Yes. Uh, 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 contrary to the common sense, uh, uh, we do not have the zeal to keep the ownership uh, or the privacy of the data. Uh, our interest is just to share, because uh, all of the cohorts, uh, Malco with 90,000, uh, uh, Elsa Brazil 15,000, uh, are uh, small cohorts. You need to share uh, with the other cohorts. It's uh, mandatory for us. But uh, what's difficult, uh, second and agonist, uh, is that the harmonization is uh, a very interesting uh, word, uh, harmonization, but it's very difficult uh, to do uh, because it, uh, it's the same problem. Uh, the IT people to do that. Uh, uh, same when we are sharing 
information uh, in Brazil with other uh, researchers uh, uh, speaking Portuguese and with the same culture, oh, you have uh, no more, no, no, no less, no, no less than uh, half a year uh, to to share the information, and it's not easy because now you have almost uh, twenty thousand primary variables. Uh, so and the uh, a lot of the secondary variables. Uh, to share, it's very difficult. I think that's the problem that you have. Um, not only the harmonization, but after how you uh, provide for the other researchers the exact information that uh, uh, he or she needs. Uh, one example, uh, you have seven definitions of diabetes mellitus. mellitus uh, and the, for a stroke, uh, it's possible you have uh, uh, four or five definitions. Then. So uh, for uh, each research question, uh, you need a different variable uh, to be sharing with the other uh, studies. Okay, so the, uh, Agnes, I know the issue of uh, uh, data sharing and uh, data governance, uh, do you also have some challenges? And how, how do you think that uh, ICC or can help uh, to navigate around this issue? Uh, yes, I think uh, anyone who tries to bring data from different places clearly uh, has to encounter problems around sharing and governance. Uh, speaking from the African perspective, um, Africa has 55 countries. Sometimes we tend to put this in one box, but Africa has 50 countries, 55. And in these 55, you find about a third do not have a data protection policy. And because of that, the whole discussions around data sharing uh, become difficult. For those that have, there's a lot of diversity. What do you share? When do you share it? To what extent do you share the data? So as we are trying to engage the different data producers where we, you know, that contribute to inspire, we have to be, we are cognizant of the fact that there are already existing policies that might or hinder or promote access to the data from the different producers. So manipulating these and, and making the data producers aware of what our intent is vis-a-vis -vis what um, their policy stipulates is also something we need to navigate. But in terms of harmonization, um, Yes, there's a lot of diversity, but it, you know, with available platforms for data sharing and uh, harmonization vocabularies that are out there that can help us put this data together and uh, create an environment where we don't really have to take the data, but maybe work under federated approach is the, is, is the route that we are using and making this message, uh, passing this on to the data producers in terms of sharing is what we actually have embarked on as Inspire to be the foot soldiers around uh, spreading the gospel of federated environments, training teams, you know, to uh, create this kind of, uh, um, of code and platforms that can support, maintain the ownership, but only share what you can and not really the whole data set, but through uh, ETLs that support uh, access to the data in a, in a formalized manner. So it's a, it's a common approach, but um, so I think um, cohorts like IHCC would be learning from how they've maneuvered these with a variety of cohorts is something would be really uh, willing to learn and, and take some notes on how to be successful at data sharing when you have multiple cohorts. That's great. Well, I, I, I'm really interested in knowing how did you even get started to think about uh, pulling together different cohorts. Uh, is it that you, uh, you you got the funding first, or you just started talking to different different uh, uh, PI and put them together? How did that idea come from? And how did you coordinate that at the beginning, uh, Agnes? Uh, so the Inspire is it was twenty nineteen, and I must admit it was developed after the I want to say collapse of the in depth network. So there were many cohorts in Africa that was contributing data to the in-depth. I'm, I'm not too sure they collapsed or didn't collapse. I don't have much data around that. But uh, it, we picked up that because we already, they were already collaborating in different aspects under the in-depth. 
So in a bid to pick this up, in a bid to answer questions that were pertinent, at least to the Eastern Africa region, we needed large data sets, large sample sizes. So when we saw this opportunity, that is when the Inspire Network um, was formulated around two years ago. And it's not like we had the funding. No, we actually didn't have any of the funding and are still looking for funding. But we are determined to have data from different parts of Africa pulled together to answer questions that represent the different regions of Africa, the 55 countries, and have questions that speak to us with uh, questions that are developed in country that um, are developed by the people who need the answers most in a nutshell. Okay, so maybe uh, uh, maybe lastly for me, uh, Paulo, I want to ask you, if you were to start all over again, so what would you do differently? What would you do different? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, I think uh, uh, I will try since the beginning uh, to have a, a link uh, with much more with the stakeholders, with the community, with the media. Uh, now uh, you have in Brazil uh, uh, a good uh, scientific uh, production, but uh, good for the uh, international index of science. But uh, most of the knowledge from our cohorts uh, are not being applied uh, for the people, for the poor people here. So. Uh, if you begin again a cohort, uh, you have much more uh, uh, answer, uh, uh, a strong tie uh, with the primary care, with the people working in with health community. Uh, I think that it's, uh, I will do uh, change what you did uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so is that the same for you, Agnes? And at the beginning, you were saying that uh, the Inspire Network is not currently part of ICC uh, because you are not, you don't have up to 100,000 uh, participants yet. But is that the case for Africa? I'm not sure you need 100 participants. <laughs> no, no, I was just joking. We certainly have um, more than 100,000 to date. And, okay. um, and and will definitely join IHCC. Um, but if I was, yeah, if I was to do this again, I, I, I think training teams that support this cohort is really critical to their success and the sustainability. And uh, if we can get, you know, governments from which the data are collected to invest and understand the value of pulling data together, I would probably engage them from the start. Sometimes as researchers, we go ahead with our idea and then bring on the stakeholders later, but I'll have the data teams trained early, bring the stakeholders, like Paula has said, to buy into the whole idea because we need funding in the country and not always depending on the global north for sustaining of these cohorts. So it's something we are doing now, and but in retrospect, it should start from disseminate the value of, of, of cohorts and and stakeholder engagement, and then uh, move forward with creating this cohort. Great, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Paula and uh, Agnes. I really enjoyed this uh, discussion. Uh, thank you very much for the excellent uh, uh, yeah. uh, answer that you're giving to all the questions I've asked today. Thank you. Uh, over to you. Yeah.